When we set our goals, it is important for you to identify what that goal is. And we need to be very sensible about that. We can't just say to ourselves, I want to be a competitive boxer and a competitive swimmer and a marathoner. I want to bench press 400 pounds and I'm going to look like Superman, right? And I want to be a martial artist. <laughs> you know, all of these things require different types of training. And some of these types of training oppose each other. So we have to be very selective and we have to understand that certain types of training give you certain types of adaptations and res results and we cannot do all of it. First of all, there isn't enough time in the day, right? Most of us have lives. We have jobs, we have family, we have hobbies, we have things that we need to also include in our life. And even if these things didn't compete with each other in terms of these training methods, um, you still wouldn't have enough time in the day to do them all. So when you're planning your course of action, you need to consider all of these things. What kind of lifestyle do you like having? Um, what kind of stress does your job bring? Does your family bring? What are your, your sleeping habits like? What are your food preferences? Do you have the discipline to do the things that this kind of goal setting requires? All of this will impact the results that you get, your ability to stay on course. Whether you're using the Brick 20 or anything else, when you're setting your goal for anything, you need to take all the inventory of the elements involved in that and find out if it's realistic to begin with. So most of us want to achieve fast results, right? And of course, nobody wants to receive, achieve slow results, even though sometimes slow is as fast as it can be. <clears throat> That's understandable that we want fast results. But here's the thing is that a lot of times people think that the harder you train, the faster the results come. That's simply not true. You need to train smart to get fast results, right? First of all, you don't want to get injured, but you also have to understand that some exercises will give you 70% reward for your investment. Others will give you 80 or 90 or 100% reward for your investment. And the, the percentage of reward is directly related to the speed with which you achieve that goal. So here's the thing is a lot of people believe mistakenly that Isolation exercises take longer to let your body develop the way you want to develop than compound exercises. And that's false because it makes the assumption that a compound exercise works, let's say, three or four muscles at one time. Um, and so you might think, therefore, that you're going to get a result, a, a, a physical result that's three or four times faster than you would if you did three or four separate isolation exercises for those same muscle groups. But the problem is that when you evaluate an exercise using biomechanical principles, you realize that many of these compound exercises do not give you the same reward for each participating muscle as you would get when you do isolation exercises. Interestingly, some people actually know this. So it's very common for a bodybuilder to do a compound exercise, let's say a a barbell squat, they don't then go to the next, let's say, lats or abs, right? They do more legs. They also do isolation exercises. So they, even they know that doing a compound exercise isn't enough for each participating muscle. So here's the question that it boils down to. Who, who's the smarter person? Who, what's the smarter strategy here? Is it the person who does the compound exercise plus three isolation exercises and gets X results? Or is it the person who does three X isolation exercises and gets the same results, skips the compound exercises, skips the extra time and extra effort, gets the same result? So that's what it's all about, in fact, is, you know, you can't, you're not comparing apples with apples when you're doing compound and a bunch of isolation exercises versus a bunch of isolation exercises. What you really want to do is you want to compare compound only with isolation only and then see what results you get. And, and ironically enough, a lot of people don't have the confidence, the courage, the logic, really, in fact, to do their own testing, right? They're afraid that they're not going to get as good a result as they can get by doing one thing or the other. So they do it all. And then you don't know what worked, right? So... When you're setting your goal, we need to really acknowledge the logic, the intelligence, the science behind certain things, and, and, and try to get to the point where we're doing the smartest program, giving us the best results for the amount of energy invested. 
So in the bottom here, what I talk about is compound exercises, calisthenics, yoga, Pilates, kettlebells, etc. These things all have their place, but there has to be a way, and there is a way, and this is what the Brignoli Method is about. It is the way that you can measure the contribution of each exercise to your end result. And once you identify these me means of measure, you can then clearly see the contribution that each of these exercises contributes or doesn't, fails to contribute, right? So if your goal is, let's say, um, uh, to, to be a strong lineman on a football field, well, then you're going to have to simulate lineman type of activities, right? Do, do the, do, does the break 20, do these exercises help the lineman? Yes, of course they do. But um, there are certain specialty adaptations that you might have to have, certainly endurance, right, that might require additional forms of training. But what we're doing here with the break 20 and the isolation exercise is we're creating the absolute best simulation for each individual muscle of our body. And then all of those muscles work very, very well together when they need to. They don't have to develop simultaneously. If they're all strengthened separately, they can all work together when they need to. Skill training, proprioceptive training, is a different kind of adaptation, but it's not better for each participating muscle than his isolation exercise. All right, let's move on. So the question is, for whom is the break 20 most useful? Well, it's for everyone, in fact. I mean, who wouldn't benefit from having a stronger pectoral muscle, a stronger bicep, a stronger quadricep, a stronger hamstring, right? It's all about strengthening these muscles optimally, separately. That's what this is all about. Now, when you have optimally strengthened muscles, optimally developed muscles, they do very well together, right? There's no dysfunction. There are some people who will criticize isolation exercise as being dysfunctional as opposed to functional training, and that's just false. I mean, I'm sure you know some people that do isolation exercises. Do you see them as acting spastic? Do you see them as being unable to coordinate their muscles when they need to? That's ridiculous, right? There's lots of other endeavors in addition to fitness where we work the different elements, we build the different elements, and then we put them all together, and then we make it happen together. There's lots of endeavors that work that way. Fitness and bodybuilding works the same. 